Good morning. It's a sea of blue out here this morning. Uh, not blue as in sad, but blue. And uh, uh, today we kind of show our support for autism awareness. I said I, I may get fired today, but I'm going to be out of uniform. I wanted to show my support as well, and uh, not only just for autism, but to show our support for for Camden Hurst and that family that we all love and hold so dear to our hearts. So I proudly wear my blue today, and uh, I know you do as well. But we're here to worship the Lord this morning. We've already got it started off this Palm Sunday. Uh, looking forward to the service today. Beautiful weather, beautiful crowd, and uh, I'm just looking forward to, the, uh, to God uh, showing up this morning and good things happening. So let's begin with a word of prayer and then uh, grab a songbook, read along, uh, but worship the Lord this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we come now thanking you so much for this day. We thank you for all your many blessings, Lord. And we just pray above all else that your name is exalted here this morning. Lord, we just love you so much. We love our, uh, our church family, Lord, and uh, many of us have what we would probably call hurdles, Lord, but you see them as springboards, Lord, and our faith is in you to uh, to be in the lives of each one of our church family. Lord, bless our service this morning again, and uh, we just love you so much, for it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Turn to number 260, a worship the King. 260.
Thank you, Brooke. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Can't help but say I'm sure proud of our young people. What a, what a blessing. Again, I want to welcome you to the service today. If, if you're visiting with us, we're certainly glad to, to have you with us this morning. I want to talk this morning about what God did we're going to be in the book of Colossians, chapter 1, this morning. What God did through His Son, Jesus Christ. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come now thanking You again for this day, Lord. We thank You for this, uh, this time of worship. Lord, we thank You for the, uh, the songs of praise that we sang and the special that we heard, Lord. What a powerful name, the name of Jesus, Lord. And we... We lift that name above all else this morning. Uh, Lord, just bless our time now. Lord, open our hearts and to receive the things your Spirit may have for us this morning. Lord, if there is one here that doesn't know that wonderful name of Jesus, we pray that today would be the day that they come to know Jesus as their Savior. Lord, we love you so much, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. This is Palm Sunday, uh, the day commemorating the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. Luke 19 records that event, telling us in verse 37 and 38, And when He was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. This this huge multitude had gathered. They were, uh, the historian Josephus, he estimates as many as three million people may have been in and around Jerusalem at this time. And Jesus is entering and they're singing praises. They're singing like the, the, the children were singing, Hosanna to the King. And, and undoubtedly with this many people there, there were some, you know, walking around, hey, what did he do? Who is this? What, what did he do? And someone may have responded, well, what do you mean what did he do? I was there the day he fed 5,000 people with five biscuits and two sardines. You should have seen it. Somebody else may have said, hey, I had a cousin that was blind as a bat. And this Jesus made him to where he can see. Undoubtedly, the responses would, would have went on and on about the wonderful things that Jesus did. And it appears that who many thought Christ was 
and who they wanted Christ to be may not have always been the same thing. Jesus later in that passage, he weeps about the things that he said were hid from their eyes. Our purpose this morning is for nothing to be hidden from our eyes about what God has done for us. The church at Colossae was a a young church, and being a young church, they were susceptible to to being led astray. They weren't far from the church at at Ephesus, and uh, maybe a hundred miles or so, and no doubt the church of uh, the Colossians was kind of an offspring from that church. Colossae was probably seven to eight years old at the time of Paul's writing to them, and Paul had never visited there to uh, to our knowledge. And Paul's in prison when he writes this. And Brother Epaphras, uh, the, the pastor or the leader of the church at Colossae, he comes to Paul and pays him a visit. And undoubtedly he had some questions because some false doctrines had started in infiltrating that church. It's like messing with someone. You know, they, they may not know a thing in the world about baseball. Maybe it's a young kid and Somebody hits one over the fence and we tell them that's called a touchdown. Well, they don't know any better. They start listening and they'll, they'll call a home run a touchdown until somebody tells them the, the, the truth of what it, what it really is. They're easily persuaded. And that's the way this, this young church was. They were likely easily persuaded by these, these false doctrines that, that were coming in. And maybe we have people here today that Uh, that may have questions about just what God did. And what God did is the simplicity of the gospel. Now the Apostle Paul was a a master at defending the gospel. A lesson for us in defending the gospel is to do as Paul did. He defended the gospel by, by being offensive about the gospel, about knowing the gospel. And about speaking the gospel. He could have told the church at Colossae. Now now what they're telling you. They're telling you this. He could have have went into everything these false teachers were telling them. He didn't do that. He told them what God did. See the Colossians were already believers. They had already heard the gospel. They had already accepted the gospel. And now this other stuff was clouding their mind. Paul carried them back to the base. He regrounded them, so to speak. He firmed up that foundation. And that's what we want to do here this morning. It's just firm up that foundation of the gospel within all of us. Colossians 1, uh, verse 12. We're going to read three verses beginning in verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. In whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And the first thing we want to look at in, in, in this is, this is all God's plan. It says, thanks to the Father. Thanks be to God. We talked a little bit Wednesday night. But it has always been God's plan to have a relationship with man. This is, that's not a side note. God created man in his image. He created man to have a loving, intimate relationship with man. Before creation, before the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, after the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, and throughout the Old Testament, throughout the New Testament, and right through to this very moment, God's desire is to have a relationship with each one of us. That's what we're here to worship Him for because the great Creator, the Master of the universe, the Creator of all things, thinks about you and me. He loves you and me and desires this relationship. Ephesians 1.4 tells us, according as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. Now I need you to grasp what that verse says for a moment. I tell you all the time when we're reading Scripture, take it personal. Well here we are again. This tells us, He hath chosen me. And when you read this, He has chosen you. He has chosen each one of us before the foundation of the world that we or me and you 
we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. This verse said, God has chosen us for this relationship. He has chosen you for this intimate relationship. He's chosen me. He wants this relationship filled with love with each one of us. God desired us to be set apart and without blame because that's the only way we can approach Him is sinless and without blame. Well, sin, you know, that, that kind of messed it up. But the relationship is still His plan. That, that desire of God didn't dissolve with sin. Man just kind of messed it up and sin separated us from God. The relationship was dissolved by sin, but God had already made a plan to bring us back. Now back to our text, verse 12 says, God hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance. Now what does that mean, God has made us meet? It means God enabled us. It means in southern terminology, He made us fit. He made us fit to come into His presence. You know, when I was little, if we, we came to the supper table with dirty hands and, and, and dirty clothes, mom or daddy, they'd run us off and tell us, you ain't fit to sit at this table. And we'd have to go clean up, you know, before we could come and, and, and sit down for supper. Uh, we can't come to God either with unaccounted for sin in our lives. We're not fit to be in God's presence. Sin made us unfit for the relationship. But God made a plan. He made a way. Verse 12 tells us that we weren't fit, but He enabled us to be partakers of the inheritance. To partake means to, to join in or to, or to take part in the experience of something. God made us fit to join in and experience the inheritance that He has for all of His saints. And notice that it is God that did this. Verse 12 begins with giving thanks to the Father. Giving thanks to God. And we shouldn't. We should never. But if we ever wonder why it is so important to be thankful to God, here it is. We were not fit to be partakers of God. We were not fit for this relationship that every human on earth desires. But God made a way. That's where this thanksgiving comes in. That's why we are to be so thankful. That's what Romans 5, 8 means. But God commended. God demonstrated His love. This love that, uh, that He wants with each one of us. God showed us how much. He didn't just say how much He loved us. He showed us how much He loved us. He showed us how much He desired this relationship. We're to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. A saint is someone that God has set apart. Believers, they're set apart for something special, which is this inheritance that we'll talk about in a moment. We hear the terms light and darkness throughout the Bible. The contrast between light and dark began in Genesis chapter 1. The earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. It was a dark and chaotic place until God spoke. He simply spoke. He said, let there be light. And there was light. Light changes things. God is light. And when a person turns his life over to God, he's turning his life over to the light. And where there is light, there can be no darkness. They don't coexist. Ourselves, much like the earth, was void and without form. We were in darkness. Darkness is representative of the chaotic, evil, sinful life without God. And verse 13 tells us that God delivered us not just from darkness, but from the power of darkness. The power of darkness mentioned here is significant because it indicates that there is a kingdom, there is a realm of darkness that desires to rule over men. Darkness of course represents evil and wickedness and does just what we think darkness would do. It prevents men from seeing who God is, who Jesus Christ is and where He came from and why He came. It prevents men from seeing and 
understanding the simplicity of the gospel. The dark, it blinds men from, from seeing or thinking about or considering his eternity. Darkness even blinds the born again Christian to the importance of walking in the light. They choose to stay in the dark because nobody can see me there. Darkness blinds men from the truth. Ephesians 4.18 says, Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. This verse basically says, Some men have lived in the dark so long that they don't understand how great it is to live in the light. The darkness has become their comfort. That's one of the effects of persecution that the early church was facing. The effects of false teaching to avoid being uncomfortable and avoid conflict. People would compromise the truth. And that same thing is happening in our world today. And I've said it before and I'll say it many more times and I can't stress it enough. The Word of God is not up for discussion or compromise to fit our comfort zone. People stay in the darkness because it's easier. And the Bible said, never said, the Bible never said being a Christian and serving the Lord would be easy. John 15, 19, if you were of the world, the world would love his own. In other words, if you're part of the world and you're doing everything in the world and you're, you're sitting in the, in the world, the world's going to love you because you're one of them. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. In other words, being a Christian is not going to be easy because people live in darkness and darkness and light cannot coexist. Come here, Wes. I hadn't had fun in a long time. All right, I want you to do something for me. I want you to go up there to any chair in that choir and get a songbook out. Not that one. I'm, I'm kidding. All right, open to page 32 and sing for it. No, I'm kidding. You don't have to sing. All right, set it in any chair you want to. All right, now come back. Head's bigger than I anticipated. <laughs> Can you breathe? Yeah. Can you see? You're in the dark. Now, you, it was easy to go up there and get that songbook out, right? It was really, really easy to get it out, wasn't it? You were walking in the light. There was no darkness. It was all good. Now you're walking in darkness. All right, go get the songbook. Watch the step. Okay. All right, let me help you. You're going the wrong way here. All right, what, step. No, 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 no. Wait, let's, let's, let's get over here and sit down. Sit down right there. Okay. All right, don't move. It's hard to walk when you can't see where you're going. And you notice where I led him. I could have led him up the stairs, I could have led him to God's inheritance. I could have showed him the way instead. I gave him an easy route over here to sit down. That's what the world tells us. That's what the world wants to do for us, to take us to a comfort, comfortable place and never realize what's up there, what God has for us. Not, not just a future in heaven, but what God has for us right now. Wes, do you believe in Jesus? You believe everything Jesus tells you? You believe in the kingdom of heaven? All right, now walk up there and get that book. Watch your step. <laughs> okay, all right. Go, up, no, go back, go back, go back. <laughs> now what are we missing here? What are we missing? We're missing the simplicity of the gospel. 
You said you believed in Jesus. Just take off the blindfold. Thank you. That's all. Just take it off. We believe in Christ. We say we put our faith in Christ. We believe in His promises. But yet we choose to leave the, the blindfold on. We, we believe we, we're going to stay in the dark. We don't have to do that. We have the Word of God. We have a church family. A loving community to support one another. And we work together to receive this inheritance that God has for us. It's so common to profess Christ and think we're all alone and stay and simply just stay in the dark. I know all of this sounds so simple, but the gospel in itself is simple. That is the way God intended it. Yet when Jesus entered Jerusalem, many of them didn't get it. They rejected him. They chose to, to keep the blindfold on. The church at Colossae had heard the gospel. They had accepted Jesus. But they needed that faith reinforced from the false teachers. They were trying to make these waves in the church. The power of darkness, this realm of darkness is trying to blind people even today. We must stay grounded in our faith. We must stay grounded in our belief and our uh, uh, faith in God's promises. As we look at the trying times that we live in today, how many lose sight of that inheritance? How many lose sight of the promises of God? How many will choose to stay in the dark when God has promised to deliver us out. God has made us fit. He delivered us from this power of darkness that we may be partakers of the inheritance. So let's look for a moment at exactly what this inheritance is. And what most people believe this inheritance is when we're saved, I'm going to heaven. That's salvation. That is it. I am going to heaven. And that is a true statement, but salvation is much more than that. Salvation is so much more. God's inheritance for believers is so much more than that. Yes, we are an heir to eternal life, Titus 3, 7, that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We're mentioned as heirs of salvation. Speaking of the angels in Hebrews 1, 14, who serve those who will inherit salvation. Are they not ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? We're heirs of glory, Romans 8, 17, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. And so be if we suffer with Him that we may be also glorified together. We're heirs of righteousness, Hebrews 11, 7, reminds us of the faith of Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness, which is by faith. We're heirs of God's special favor. Ephesians 1, 11, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ. We're the heirs of heavenly rewards. Colossians chapter 3, verse 24, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. And we're heirs of an immortal and perfect body. At the return of Christ, 1 Peter 1, 4, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you. We are heirs of God right now, as 1 Corinthians 2, 9 tells us. Eye hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. That's part of that inheritance. We can't fully understand what God 
has prepared for us, not just in heaven, but right now when we take the blinders off. What God has right here and right now when we choose to walk in the light that and get out of the darkness that the Bible tells us He has delivered us from. Now back to our text in verse 12. and The first part of verse 13. God has done this. And now Paul's about to transition into how God did it. And we can call this the very heart of the gospel. Everything that, that God did for us and continues to do and will do in the future is because of our faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. The end of verse 13 says that God translated us or he, he transferred us into the kingdom of His dear Son. And that's interesting because that signifies that this kingdom already exists. It doesn't say He will transfer us into heaven when we die. It says He has transferred us into the kingdom of His dear Son. That kingdom exists right now. Yes, it is, exists in heaven. The rule and reign of Christ already exists in heaven. The Bible tells us to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so the kingdom of heaven does exist. But we also know that upon our belief in Jesus Christ we are given the Holy Spirit to reign in our hearts. Right now, right here in this physical world, upon accepting His Son, Jesus Christ, we are transferred at that moment, from darkness into the kingdom of His dear Son, Jesus Christ, our inheritance begins at salvation. We have to take the blindfold off to see it, to experience it. Notice, if you will, in verse 12 and the first part of verse 13, it is God and man. You can see it says, thanks to the Father. You've got the Father. We are thankful to the Father. He made us fit. He delivered us from darkness. He had light and darkness. He translated us into the kingdom of His Son. One side of the fence we have God. The other side of the fence we have man. You got light on one side. You got darkness on the other. And it was separated by that fence of sin. But God's desire was to bring man back across the fence. And he did this through his only begotten son. We find in verse 14 the word redemption. Having been recovered or, or, or bought back is what that means. Being redeemed takes on the thought of, of buying back a slave. Slaves to darkness is what we were. Slaves to sin is what we were. Separated from God. But God delivered us out of slavery. He redeemed us. And brought us back to Him, to that fellowship, that desire He has uh, to have this relationship with each one of us. God did that. He bought us back with the blood of His very own Son, Jesus Christ. That blood paid our debt. That blood brought us back across the fence to God. We weren't fit to partake of it. But Jesus Christ, living that perfect and sinless life, was fit. He was justified to be in the presence of God, fulfilling the law, never sinning. But God saw fit to bring us back to partake of that with Jesus. So Jesus sacrificed himself on the cross. And that blood paid for our sins. The Apostle Paul reminded the Colossians of the power of the gospel. I pray that we're reminded today of God's desire for that close, intimate, and loving relationship with each and every one of us. God did this for us. And each one of us can take our finger and say, God did this for me. God desires a relationship with me. And we can go to the Father and we can be thankful and we can also pray. Help me take the blindfold off. Help me see what you have for me right now. Help me to see 
your love. Help me to see your goodness. Help me desire you as much as you desire me, God. Open our hearts to the Lord. If you're here today and you're wandering lost in the darkness, God did this for you too. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, God did this for you too. All you have to do is believe. All you have to do is trust and take the blindfold off and accept Christ today and see the goodness of God open up in your life. You will partake of the inheritance. You will be part of the family of God. He will receive you today if you only believe in his dear son. Dear Heavenly Father, we come now to this time of invitation. Lord, I just pray that uh, if there is one here, and Lord, they've got the blindfold on. They're walking in darkness. They, they can't see where they're going, Lord. Just let them find the light today, the light that is your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, grant courage where it's needed. Make decisions. And Lord, we're just so grateful for your son. We're so grateful for Jesus Christ who willingly gave his life that we could be brought back into your presence and experience your love, your grace. We love you, dear Lord, for it's in Jesus' name I ask these things. Amen. Would you stand as we sing? Trust him this morning. Simple belief, simple trust. The love of God will bring you back into his will, into his home. Thank you for your kind attention this morning. It's been a good day already. Remember service, evening services tonight, 5 o'clock. Hope you can make it for that. Choir practice. Choir practice. Next Sunday is Easter. It's hard to believe. You know, it'll be Christmas in just three or four more Sundays. Way of prayer request. Uh, of course, we're all aware of the tornadoes this week. We definitely want to remember all of those families affected by that. And, I know some of our number are, have been working and helping and clean up and uh, just want to ask our prayers for, for each one of those. Uh, Ms. Pauline Harrington mentioned her brother uh, this morning had a heart attack up in Branson, I think she said. want to uh, definitely remember him. Uh, anyone, uh, any of you want to mention this morning? Tammy's cousin passed away. Also, Miss Duranda is at, at home. I heard she had a pretty good day yesterday. Definitely want to remember her. Others? 
Tim Kemp family. All right. Miss Kim has her testing this Thursday, you said? Yes. All right. A bunch of testing. we we'll definitely remember her. All right, Ms. Carden's sister, Melissa. Any others? All right, I think, yeah. And also, while Cameron's coming up here, I think they want a picture uh, of everybody uh, this morning wearing their blue. say one time when you hear Camden holler that means he's happy maybe we need to holler more often ourselves your son is never a hindrance at this church he's a blessing and uh, prayers support anything y'all need this church family's behind you I thought about it this morning you know oftentimes what we see in our lives is a as a hindrance, God sees it as a springboard, as an opportunity. Thank you all for involving Camden in this church. All right, anything else we need to hear before we're dismissed this morning? All right, Brother Harold, would you dismiss us, please? <laughs>